So I'm happy to introduce um, our two pediatricians. So I'll start with Dr. Um, Ode, who's our field pediatrician and technical advisor for Anima, who's calling in from, from France. And so um, there may be a little bit of a delay, so I hope that um, everything will run smoothly, but welcome. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cecily. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Bumiade. I'm a pediatric ICU specialist, um, and I work with Alima now as a, a field pediatrician and um, the, the pediatric advisor. Um, and a lot of what I do involves field work, um, going to the projects in the, the sites that we serve, and um, supporting the, the field teams and identifying areas of improvements and outlining ways to improve um, our practice. Um, yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Shepard, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Susan Shepard. I'm a pediatrician. I used to practice in uh, rural Montana and Butte, Montana. Uh, until 2005 or 2006, I had started working as a, in humanitarian projects in 2003 um, and finally joined Alima in 2014 uh, when I was medical coordinator for the um, Ebola response in Guinea. And in that project, my major task was to initiate our first clinical trial uh, in collaboration with partners from, uh, from the French Institute in Sem. So from the very beginning with Alima, I, my role has been to facilitate the uh, setting up of research projects in various, um, various uh, sites around Alima's universe. Um, and most recently, I've been involved in setting up trials that uh, test different strategies to improve the treatment for acute malnutrition. Great, well, thank you for that introduction. So what I wanted to do first was sort of ask both of you um, to describe um, Alima's mission for supporting pediatric uh, health, sort of a bird's eye view, if you will. Right, well, I'm sure it's not lost on anybody that uh, about half of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa are people under the age of 15. And so by almost um, inescapably, anybody who's working in Sub-Saharan Africa is doing a lot of pediatric care. Um, for Adima, we focus, Adima has, um, was born out of uh, our projects, uh, projects in treating acute malnutrition in Niger, and that has always been a major focus for us. And this, um, so treating acute malnutrition um, almost exclusively focuses on children under five and truthfully under, under age three. Um, and uh, we also treat malaria, which is also um, you know, disproportionately affects young children. And so every year, at least half of the clinical contacts that we have within Alima are children under five. And I think last year we did 44,000 births, which means you know, we're, we're caring for 44 newborns as well, 44,000 newborns as well. So this is, I think, just kind of the natural, it's just a natural focus for a medical aid organization working in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, and Dr. Ode, do you have anything to add, maybe um, sort of how this mission plays out in the field? and how Alima teams have had to sort of adapt to changing, you know, uh, environments and context. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, Susan already sort of gave a good summary of like the overview of what Alima does on the field. Um, for pediatrics uh, specifically, so a lot of what we do is malnutrition care and pediatric care, like Susan said. But when you get to the, the nuts and bolts of it, like children who get admitted or who are cared for with severe malnutrition, typically come in sick with other things as well. So those kids will often come in with severe pneumonias, malaria, like uh, Dr. Shepard said, uh, sepsis, severe diarrhea. And so those kids are often really critically sick. And so a lot of what we do is to treat those severe critical illnesses and to try to reduce mortality, apart from just getting them well nourished and recovered okay. from their malnutrition, we often have to also treat um, 
a lot of the other critical illness that they come that they come down with in addition to their malnutrition. And so there's a lot of critical care that that happens or that is needed uh, for those kids in in on, on the field project. In addition, there's the fact that Alima um, projects are interventions are usually in areas of like high crisis, a lot of instability, so crisis affected regions, areas where there are like outbreaks. So it makes the delivery of this um, of care really complicated, just accessing geographically those areas, delivering uh, the supplies and materials needed, getting the, the right people with the right skills to those areas is usually quite, um, a big project and and so that's a lot of what Alima does. Yeah, and I think um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted, but we'll wait sort of, you know, till the end. I, I'd like to sort of delve a little bit more into specific um, projects around malnutrition. So, you know, I mentioned that I went yeah. to Niger and I was really struck by um, WAC for Mothers, uh, which is a simple intervention, um, basically teaching mothers how to diagnose malnutrition in their children. And so if perhaps, um, Dr. Shepard, you could tell us a little bit about MWAC and about the, the bracelet that we have here. Right, yeah, so first we wanna make sure that everybody knows when we, we use this term MUAC, what it means is it's, it's a bracelet or it's a measuring tape for measuring middle upper arm circumference. It looks like this and we just give this bracelet to moms and they are family members and they make a, make a bracelet out of it like this. And you slip this over the child's arm and then you just tug until and you just cinch until it's tug, but not, you know, not squeezing the kid's arm and you measure or you just by color code, you can tell. So a child whose arm circumference is about like that would be classified as moderately malnourished. And once they get in what we call the red zone, less than 115 millimeters, and their arm circumference looks like that. So this simple tool is quite straightforward to teach to any community member. And it used to be the province of community health workers, but now we've actually um, marshaled community health workers to train families to keep these tapes at home and to screen their kids regularly and to come for care when they see that the child is getting into the yellow zone. I don't know if it's, it's how visible that is, yeah. And we'd certainly like rather catch them in the yellow zone rather than wait till they get into the red zone, which is where all of these more serious illnesses that Bunmi was alluding to tend to occur and how we get really sick kids in the hospital. So that's the principle behind Mother Muak. And it was uh, piloted in Niger way back in 2011, I believe. Um, you know, the thought being that many of the community health workers that we, um, that we work with are particularly literate. And it's quite easy to use this thing, especially since it's color coded. And it really did, there seemed to be a distinction without a difference between training community health workers to do this or training family members to do this. And so um, a few um, you know, simple studies that we were able to publish in 2015 in the archives of public health demonstrated that mothers and community health workers um, basically have the same precision of measure and that it's um, we're not losing any accuracy, so to speak, in delegating this tax task to families. And so with that um, proof of concept kind of established, it took off both within Adima as we scaled up using this strategy to almost all of the countries where we work now. And I think, um, and I think there are more than 10 or 15 publications that have appeared by us and other actors, um, again, demonstrating the usefulness of this approach. And um, so now it's, and it's starting even to become included in national protocols like Indonesia. This is now part of standard practice. Yeah, so it's incredible. So other organizations, NGOs, governments have actually adopted this very, very simple screening tool. Um, Dr. Ode, did you have any sort of thing to add um, and sort of, could you speak to how powerful this, this sort of simple intervention has been in the field? Yes, um, it, it's, it, it's a fantastic initiative. It conscripts families into the care of their own kids, um, into being part of the healthcare team. Because it's such a simple, straightforward tool, it can be done pretty accurately by, by regular people with a minimum of, of training. It means that 
one, not only are people like sensitized to the idea that a skinny child may not just be just skinny, but that malnourishment is a, is a serious medical condition that needs care. But in instances where people are far away from health services and they're not enough um, health workers in the community, this means that there's just this army of, of, of trained people um, who, who can now contribute to this care in identifying the kids on time and, and then now seeking help. I think it's very empowering. I think it also like improves the, the resources available to identifying and to quickly start treatments of kids with malnutrition. And that's particularly important because um, if these kids can get early care, um, they can be identified early and given care early enough, that has a huge impact on developmental outcomes and what their health outcomes are. Because we know that even with moderate malnutrition, the longer these kids stay in a state of malnutrition, the more impact it has on, on their outcomes. And the more likely they are to have developmental delays, the, the more likely this is to impact on even future economic outlook. So it helps with like just timely diagnose, diagnoses and, and, and seeking care. Thank you. And I just want to remind anyone, if anyone has any questions, please place them in the chat. Um, so now I just wanted to move on to a different program, uh, the Thousand Days program. Um, so back in 2017, Alima established comprehensive health centers for pregnant women and new mothers through the Thousand Days Project. Um, and these centers provide nutrition, vaccinations, um, clinical care for mothers, their children. Um, and, and it's been, you know, quite a quite an interesting program that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Ramita, I can uh, take that one. So the, you know, the Thousand Days Project is, um, the, describes the period between conception and a child's second birthday. So it um, concerns the, the mother-baby diet. Um, and the services provided are nothing revolutionary, right? Um, but the thing that is uh, slightly different is take a more proactive approach to the nutritional support component, which up to date had been mostly anchored in cooking demonstrations or advice and um, some uh, sometimes projects using mothers whose children seem to be doing well and trying to encourage families to be more like the mom who's doing well. Um, so <clears throat> with the advent of the outpatient treatment of acute malnutrition and a, and a supplementary food that was very safe and food stable and, or, and very effective at helping kids to gain weight, um, some people started looking at using the same type of food, but in a smaller amount to accompany kids during this critical time between six months and 18 months, 24 months, when um, they were weaning, um, but where their nutritional needs are pretty demanding and it's pretty easy to fall through the cracks. And so um, most thousand days programs actually have provide a food supplement to children in addition to vaccination and, and curative care. And so that's what we did. We've done it. Uh, we did it for three years in uh, Miria, Niger. We've also had some projects running in uh, another district in Niger, and we also currently have one running in North Cameroon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the the Lancet Nutrition Series, the most the third version of the Lancet Nutrition Series that appeared in uh, May March of this year, I believe, um, finally. Um, brought together all of this, um, all these pieces of evidence that those of us who've been working in the field have been seen emerging for the last five or six years. But the, the provision of a small amount of high quality child appropriate food um, between six to 18 months of age does a lot of things. Number one, it reduces all cause mortality by about 20%. Number two, it reduces the incidence of acute wasting, reduces the incidence of acute malnutrition. Number three, it, it, reduces the, um, it reduces the prevalence of severe stunting. It has a little bit less impact on moderate stunting, but severe stunting is significantly impacted. Number four, it reduces anemia. And number five, it improves, it improves developmental outcomes. And so it really is a 
uh, I mean, it's a, an intervention that has in wide ranging impact. And that's just for the individual child. And in addition, what we've also found is that, of course, provision of a small amount of provision of a food supplement in the well baby um, clinic also um, tends to um, bring mothers back. And so we get better vaccination coverage because they have reasons to come to the clinic. So we really see this kind of approach as a win, 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 win. Yes, <laughs> with, all, with that many <laughs> fingers, like <Yes. laughs> with all the positive things yeah. and positive mm -hmm. outcomes. Yeah. Dr. O'Day, do you have anything to add to that? No, uh, Dr. Shepard was really thorough about that. Um, <laughs> they, there's, there's not much else to add to that. It's a win, 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 win. Um, yeah. And I, I think um, it's sort of a nice segue into um, the, the third project that I wanted to touch upon regarding malnutrition is Optima. And so, um, I, Dr. Shepard, I know this is sort of, I feel like your your project, <laughs> no, <laughs> or one of your projects, many people's projects, but, yeah. um, but something near and dear to you. So maybe you could just explain what that is. So Optima is an acronym that we created for optimizing treatment of acute malnutrition. It works in French and in English, um, and it's become a, a word that's adopted throughout the, the Avima family. Um, and it is based uh, on the understanding that um, the treatment of acute malnutrition is way too complicated for um, to, to scale up beyond what is currently provided. You know, in the first, in the in the aughts, we saw a rapid scale up of treatment of acute mal severe acute malnutrition from like zero to about three million cases a year. In the teens, we added about another 2 million cases a year, but things have stagnated for the last three years, about 5 million cases a year of severe acute malnutrition. Moderate acute malnutrition honestly has not budged at all since I've been doing humanitarian medicine, about 8 million kids a year. And there, which means that you know, coverage is, is grossly inadequate. And we're, treat, we're reaching at best 30% of kids who need treatment for severe acute malnutrition, we're reaching at best 10% of kids who benefit from treatment for moderate acute malnutrition. So how to make this simpler, how to catch kids earlier so that they don't need to go to the hospital and how to do this as efficiently as possible because of course, anybody working at the World Bank or the IMF knows the biggest ding against these projects of whether thousand days or optimized, they cost a lot of money because the foods are expensive. So Optima combined the task shifting of screening to, for acute malnutrition to the families based on MUAC. It um, uses a simplified, measure, a simplified system for admitting children into treatment programs, which is only MUAC based. We don't have to do complicated measures of, of weight and height. We can just measure the MUAC tape. And it combines severe and moderate into one and uses a single, uh, single supplementary food. And so this should make it easier for health workers, easier for families, get kids into treatment earlier. And then the last thing we do is we just reduce the ration progressively as the kid gets better so that we're able to, with the same amount of supplementary food, which is the expensive part, we're able to basically treat more children. And it works out so far in the pilot studies that we've done, we're able to treat roughly this twice as many children for the same amount of RUTF that's been used for severe acute malnutrition up to date. So that's where, you know, so this was the idea behind it. We run a pilot program back in 2017 in Burkina Faso where we treated 5,000 children quite successfully. And then we have um, in partnership with our um, colleagues at INSEM, we've um, stood up two randomized controlled trials. One is concluded in, in DRC, last year and should be published momentarily. The other one is ongoing in Niger. And then we've also continued um, running pilots just to test out this strategy in uh, an urban setting in Bamako, in a Northern conflict setting in, in Faso Logo, Burkina Faso. And now we're starting this um, in next month, we'll be starting in Chad at a scale of a district. We're gonna try to treat 35,000 children a year. So mm -hmm. we're gonna try to see how well this thing scales. Um, so that's, yeah. and so the, these are all kind of interlinking parts. And I would say that, you know, MUAC for mothers is obviously an integral part of, of, of Optima. And then the other thing will be, well, what about 
once you treat a child for acute malnutrition, what categories of children should be actually put on preventive supplementation so they don't just mm -hmm. drop back down. So I think that all of these, so Thousand Days Optima and New York for Mothers all fit together as part of a whole pieces of a puzzle. Perfect. And, and it sounds like, um, so with more evidence, I would assume that a lot of other organizations might potentially adopt this. Oh yeah, and we're not the only, I mean, this is not some, you know, yeah. brainchild of Arima. I think yeah. a lot of us working in humanitarian practice for the last 10 or 15 years have recognized the need to make things simpler. Mm -hmm. And so um, Action Against Hunger has several trials that are ongoing. Um, International Rescue Committee has a protocol they call COMPASS, whose acronym I can't ever remember exactly what it means, but it's basically, it's even simpler than Optima. And actually our, we're, our trial in Niger is comparing the Niger National Protocol to the Optima strategy, to the Compass strategy. So we're basically putting them all together and testing them head to head. And I think that that, so we're all, it'll, it'll, it'll take another year or so before we have results, but we are um, hoping to have some answer to whether it makes a difference, whether you scale down progressively the amount of RUTF or whether you can just do something simple as two packets of RUTF if the MUAC is in the red zone or and one packet if it's in the yellow zone, regardless of how much the child weighs. So we'll see. Yeah, so simplifying things makes it cost effective. Yeah. And uh, cost effectiveness and is, this is the truthy. other thing. This is the major part of this. Yeah. Dr. O'Day, you wanted to say Yeah, just, I, just about simplifying things. Um, Simplifying things um, helps not just with cost effectiveness, but one of the things to remember about that context is that they're not a lot of, they're often not a lot of trained um, health staff. One of the problems uh, in the region is, is the limited number of like trained healthcare workers. And so the few people that there are have a lot of children to take care of, a lot of complicated cases to attend to. And sometimes, you know, people are not as literate as they might as they might be elsewhere in the world. And if we're thinking of like conscripting parents into this healthcare team, simplifying the process um, just makes it easier to deliver care. And so that the the one doctor who's taking care of the severe acute malnutrition kids with complications and, and critical illness doesn't have to think too hard, or the, the community health worker but the nurse don't have to think so hard about like how to the stratify the different complicated stratified ways that we prescribe care for malnourished kids. And we can just do one or the other and it becomes simpler for everyone. Yeah, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, we've, we've talked about these three different programs, MWAC, Optima, and A Thousand Days. And these are, these programs have been really the you know backbone of um, a lot of what the Lima does. And one would imagine that the pandemic has made the delivery of care, you know, probably more challenging. Um, and so I would love if you could sort of speak to that, Dr. O'Day. Um, basically how you know COVID has impacted not only the, the patients that Lima takes care of, but the delivery, um, you know, chain supply, et cetera. Yeah. It's been uh, it's been quite a challenge. Um, it's it's been quite a challenge with COVID this last two years, um, and some of some of the um, the difficulties that we have have been talked about globally. Like I talk to people outside of like the humanitarian field, and people are aware of the idea that there's an economic effect of COVID. You know, there's board, there were the border closures, there were the lockdowns. Um, in, in country lockdowns. And there was that effect on like businesses and, and the flow of like money and food and, and economic issues. And that had impact. Um, already we saw like an increase in the number of kids being diagnosed with moderate um, malnutrition. And the whole impact of, you know, lockdowns and more food insecurity and more poverty in the homes also is tied to things like increased domestic violence, increased hunger, malnutrition, illness. But are there other things that affect us directly in our operations? But 
things like supply chain issues, like you mentioned, Cicely. Um, I was surprised. I, I remember my first mission that I went to um, after the COVID, after COVID had started, the first lockdown, the borders had been closed for about three months. And I went to Niger and there were so many drugs that we were lacking and materials and gloves and things like that. And to think about like the delivery chain, it wasn't just that countries that were making this, um, some of these medications and supplies like in other continents, there were some materials and medications that were now critical to their care of their own um, COVID patients. There were interruptions with like transportation because there was just this global transportation mess with like the lockdowns and the border closures. But then there was also like in country like diversions. There were materials that would arrive in country but were needed in areas where there were like um, more hospital admissions for, for COVID cases, like in capitals and urban areas. And so things weren't getting to like the remote areas where we were working or the crisis um, uh, afflicted areas where we were working. But then there was more than that. There were people who were now afraid to access care because they were afraid of um, contact with the virus. So the, the United Nations uh, Global Overview of Humanitarian, um, the State of Humanitarian Care, just reported that there was just less antenatal care, kids missed vaccinations, people didn't access care as they usually would. And so all of that um, just was this like intertwined, like just intertwined um, series of factors that made delivering healthcare like a lot more complicated. Um, yeah, th there was just a little, whole lot more like ruptures in supply of medications and supplies that we needed because of COVID. In addition to the other things like the economic like impact of 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 COVID because of like just food insecurity and and more poverty. Um, but it wasn't all bad. Um, Susan can tell you some of the 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 good parts that came out of um, of COVID, if we can say that in in our line of work. I know there was there was a whole lot more resources that was um, put into supplying oxygen materials and oxygen equipment in a lot of several parts of the world. And, and our projects and our countries benefited from this um, influx of, of resources. Um, Susan, do you want to talk about the oxygen um, project? Yeah, the, um, so the, with the arrival of the pandemic, of course, the emergency became to diagnose people who were who had pneumonia, most specifically who had um, hypoxia, so low blood oxygen. So many of you may be familiar with that little red light on the tip of your finger that's called a pulse oximeter that uh, can non-invasively measure oxygen saturation. And this kind of device has been uh, so standard. I mean, it's just been part of the normal medical vital signs that have taken in any clinic or, or emergency room or anywhere here in, the, in Europe or, or North America, but um, pulse oximeters are um, relatively rare where we work, and they certainly had not been um, sent out into the outpatient, into the, to the ambulatory clinics at all. So um, all of a sudden there was money for pulse oximeters to go out everywhere. So we're, it's um, accelerated, I think, this trend towards improving access to diagnostic tools um, at the first level of patient contact. Uh, to give uh, to give whether you know nurse it's primarily nurses generally who are staffing or doing the medical de decision making in outpatient clinics to give them more tools to um, to make better decisions to help them decide who's critically ill and who um, who isn't so that was definitely one of the silver linings of the pandemic for us and then second of all um, this big push for a, a problem that we have known about for a long time but just to has not received any, or no, it's just kind of been stagnant. It's access to oxygen. And so we've um, 
for a long time, we've just been relegated to using these portable oxygen concentrators that are a challenge to maintain, that provide uh, uh, only a, a minimum, in a very low level of oxygen supply. And so now we've been, um, we and others have received funding to improve oxygen generation plants and, uh, to, div and to look into new ways of supplying more oxygen more reliably in hospitals um, with what's called you know, low pressure systems. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in uh, solar power oxygen concentrators that can be used in you know, peripheral health centers that won't be reliant, that won't be reliant on generators for use. So I think that there's um, this, I see several intersections in particular with our agenda for um, improving our work in relation to um, carbon economy and, uh, and the sensitivity to environmental impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you bring up a good point that even before the pandemic, before COVID, respiratory disease was one of the leading factors um, leading to increased child mortality, morbidity. And so even before the pandemic, this was a big issue. And yeah. so um, I guess, you know, we always talk about silver linings, but this was potentially a silver lining. Um, are there any sort of collaborations with any groups, any groups, you know, like looking at the solar um, powered oxygen. That's I do not. I, I know that it has brought us and I'm since I'm not the person on this, yeah. I won't be able to, to list them, but I know yeah. that it has brought us into contact with um, engineering groups who are specialized a in the uh, construction of what's called pressure swing so PSA plants is how you generate oxygen and also mm -hmm. in um, ways to and, and yes, how you can supply oxygen with, uh, with these solar powered mm -hmm. Um, oxygen concentrators, which are a relatively new device that haven't been um, mm. tested in the field yet. I mean, in a similar vein, we're also going to test um, cold chain, uh, uh, basically a refrigerator that uses some innovative way of maintaining temperature batteries. I think solar power batteries that mm. we'll be using in our COVID vaccination campaign in Asia. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, just um, we on the solar powered uh, and energy efficient oxygen concentrators and when talks with uh, one of the universities in Germany um, to see which of the doctoral students um, will work on, on one being more energy efficient in our use of um, equipment, electrical equipment in oxygen delivery, but also like uh, you talked about the solar powered um, because energy is a huge problem with oxygen delivery on the field. Um, sometimes often we use um, generators, but those are not um, environmentally friendly. And sometimes even the delivery of like fuel to those remote areas is, is difficult in itself and is not very sustainable. So we're in talks to see how to be more efficient in our energy use and in, in coming up with um, solar powered solutions. That's great. Yeah, I know Alima has really has pledged to decrease its carbon um, footprint by quite a lot yeah. in the next decade or two. So um, I think this all goes sort of hand in hand. Did you have something to add? Um, no, I think yeah. women knows more than I do about the the oxygen end of things. Yeah. Um, and so one of you just brought up uh, COVID vaccinations. And so that was another a topic I thought would be interesting to touch upon because I know that um, that's been a big sort of um, campaign. Maybe. Yeah, we've been um, since since June, Alima has been um, heavily involved in delivering vaccinations um, in seven, now eight countries. And uh, we've um, been um, we're working with ministries of health. We are unable to obtain our own supplies of vaccines, um, but so we um, work in partnership. Um, we are we've vaccinated just under three hundred thousand people so far in uh, you know seven countries, from Mauritania through Central African Republic, going through Nigeria, Niger, Mali. Um, but the um, you know the major frustration that we have is the is vaccine supply. And we have been um, placed in 
difficult situations, for example, in Mali, where they, where they say we, we have 10,000 vaccines that are going to expire in two weeks and we need somebody to deliver them now, which is, of course, we, you know, we, we respond and we do this, but it's, but you're vaccinating 10,000 when in fact you need to, need to be vaccinating 100,000. And so it's incredibly difficult to develop, you know, cogent, coherent communication strategies with, with communities to get them to understand and to, to buy into what you're doing. And so the, um, and you know, we, and you know, Omicron is just the latest lesson in what happens as this, you know, virus continues relatively, uh, relatively unchecked in, um, in under immunized or unimmunized communities. And so we've got, you know, the, so we've got the, the major in, in pressing problem of vaccine supply. We have um, also the fact that we're, of course, we're vaccinating people from age 18 and up where, but I think we just talked about, we're working on a continent where half of the population is under age 15. And so the, you know, the needs of, of young African children have yet to be directly addressed uh, in this pandemic response. But first, of course, obviously priority to vaccinating people who are over 50, people who have hypertension or diabetes, um, because the same sorts of risk factors that we have um, identified in uh, in the north and the west uh, certainly come to bear in um, in sub-Saharan Africa. We where we were able to run a trial or a run, run to document in an observational study um, the risk factors associated with death in about six thousand patients that we cared for last year in in Guinea and um, and in Burkina Faso to show that yes, exactly the same profile of people were at the highest risk of death. So, um, the uh, you know there something needs to something needs to give, and, and 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 in particular in the United States, since they have the the control, the U.S. government has the most control over the largest amount of vaccines. You know we're able. The logistics don't seem to be that are not a huge deal. I mean we are we are able to deliver Pfizer vaccines in the in the Lake Chad region, and so the you know the hyper cold chain. Is uh, is not a, a, we're able to manage. We're able to maintain the vaccine in in uh, uh, according to the conditions specified by the manufacturer. Um, so we can deliver any kind of vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to have uh, a the supply vaccine. that's <laughs> adequate to meet the need. Yeah, yeah, and that's the problem. Yeah. And actually, that's one of the things I'm proudest of. Like that, actually, um, that. Uh, COVID vaccine work means a lot to me because to understand the impact and the implication of the vaccination work we're doing, it's important to realize how isolated, how um, crisis ridden how unstable some of the zones where we, we, we see patients are. Like Susan talked about the Lake Chad region. To get there, it takes... I mean, I went there in July from Senegal and it took me like three days of travel to get finally get there. And it's far away. It's on the edge of the, the desert. It takes, um, it's 45 minutes away from like Boko Haram hotspots. The people who are internally displaced and difficult to reach and access. But some or the other, we managed to transport vaccines that need cold chains and transport people and communicate to this to the patients so the community the need to get vaccinated and to deliver those vaccines and I think that in this whole discussion about like global in inequity of vaccines there's like international inequities like some countries have access and some countries don't but even within countries like even when Chad or Nigeria gets like a supply of vaccines it's very easy to marginalize the people who are displaced, the people who are far away, the people who are, um, there's, there's an internal like inequity that's set up even within countries. And I think that our work and our reach and the logistics and, and, and all the, the network that we're able to bring to bear to deliver vaccines to the farthest and the, the, the most isolated people, that's such a work of like, bringing equity where there is none. And you know, that's just 
I, I Susan talked about all the challenges we're facing, so I won't go into all that detail again, but I just wanted to just bring out like what it takes to get these vaccines to the places and to the people that we take them to. And, and that means a lot to me personally as an individual. No, thank you for saying that. You know, it's it's helpful to sort of understand how complicated it is to get to these spots and and reach these populations. But but Alima does it. Um, but then there's a question of just not having the vaccine, <laughs> and so um, yeah, that's something that does need to change. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I think this, you know, this is sort of a nice segue into into wrapping up this discussion. Um, I'd like to know sort of what your thoughts are, both of you. Um, what you see, you know, Alima doing when going forward um, in terms of pediatric care, um, and how NGOs like Alima can be best positioned to save and improve, you know, kids' lives. You want to start for me? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's an exciting time in uh, in Alima for pediatric care. We're expanding um, and imagining new ways to improve healthcare to, to the kids that we serve in Western Central Africa and soon in East Africa. Um, we already talked about the research. A lot of the, um, the decisions that we make, clinical decisions that we make in remote parts of Africa are not actually guided by research that comes from out of those places. And so our ability to to get data, to do research, and to tailor management and treatment decisions to data that comes from there is actually like one of the things that we're excited about working on. But also we're doing a lot of work in like training and improving capacity of like staff, doctors, nurses, healthcare, other healthcare assistants and healthcare workers. We're doing a whole lot of um, in-person training, we're preparing like training modules to help people not only be better at like applying internationally accepted protocols to, to the care of sick children, but also in creating like targeted treatment options for that area, for those, for those contexts. So um, in, in July, we had, um, a seven day training session for doctors and nurses that were gathered from seven countries. There were 22 participants um, from 10 projects. And we did training on how best to take care of critically ill kids in low resource settings. And part of that training process involved not just like the care of like newborn babies, uh, critically ill malnourished kids, but also things like how to use point of care ultrasound to make diagnosis, to direct care. Because a lot of those places where we work, there are no forms of imaging like um, available. And so to find devices and, and equipment that are able to, to be adapted to, to care in that area is one of the things that we're excited about. And also, you know, just the things we're doing for just strengthening the health system. So, improving supply chain management, improving delivery of medications and, uh, and uh, equipment, improving um, uh, training and materials and, um, and just making the health ecosystem stronger for patients. I, I think that those are some of the things that we're working on some more over the next year, two years. Yeah, so I mean, having, having clinicians like wouldn't me working projects is absolutely key to us advancing and, and bringing um, bringing new tools, bringing new approaches adapted to the places that we work. And then there are people like me who see things like um, I see the malaria vaccine coming. So there's a malaria vaccine that was approved um, last year by the European Medicines Agency and or at the beginning of this year. And it um, you know, literally Malaria, malaria may be, a respiratory infection may be classified as the primary cause of death. People like me actually doubt that because <laughs> all I see is malaria. Um, and so we know that for sure, like in places like, uh, like DRC, malaria is by far and away the single largest cause of death. And we have nothing to do 
to prevent that except for bed nets, and we've reached the limit of what bed nets can do. So with a malaria, malaria vaccine, even though it's not a knockout punch, it is certainly a big um, step forward, but it's, comp it's complicated. And so I see synergies between what we were talking about, 1,000 days, and using nutritional supplements with all of their win-win-win benefits, plus associating that with a malaria vaccine, which has a complicated delivery schedule that you need to, you know, you need to have five shots or four shots between, you know, age five months and, and 18 months. So I think that that's, so that is certainly one thing that I, one area that I see us taking our expertise in nutritional support and combining it with um, a newly available vaccine. Um, I suspect that, um, you know, we will obviously keep you know, we do. We haven't talked at all about our work in emerging infectious diseases here, which is another major um, major focus for Arima. And uh, these, you know, whether it's Lassa or uh, Marburg or Ebola, I mean, these are just gonna these are gonna keep coming. Um, Lassa is gonna be a sustained uh, focus for us, and it's probably far more prevalent than anybody recognizes because it's uh, just hasn't really been well described up to date. Um, and these things obviously um, aren't, these are pediatric illnesses as well. <laughs> so, so I anticipate that we will become better and better at managing a specific, um, specific illnesses, these specific outbreak illnesses um, where kids are concerned. Um, and then lastly, I'd say it has to do with the way just the, you know, improving the general approach. I mean, the, the harsh reality is that um, kids in sub-Saharan Africa, um, they die at, you know, they die at an unacceptably high rate. And unfortunately, uh, they, they die at home. And the worst, even the worst part, the, the thing that really gets me is that they die at home. And more than half of these kids who die at home have just recently been seen, like in the past few days, for the illness which kills them. And so, you know, my particular mission is to try to get better tools, whether they be, you know, pulse oximeters or some other diagnostic tool or decision making approaches and algorithms that um, help clinicians make better decisions so that more, more kids get the, the care they need at the time that they need it. Well, thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you so much for your insights. Um, that was really so interesting. And, and I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, um, because it's not easy and you really are sort of heroes. And so thank you for all that. And I'm very honored to have spoken with both of you tonight. Um, so I also just, you know, give a little bit of a pitch here. So we wanted to, again, uh, give a huge thank you to all of those, you know, who are attending this webinar, especially from the World Bank. Many of you have been supporting Alima through the World Bank Community Connections Campaign for several years, and we really appreciate your longstanding um, work and relationship with us. Um, and just um, to sort of emphasize that supporting Alima through the workplace is a great way uh, to make your support go even further as many companies will actually match your donation. Um, and at Alima, 100% um, of what you donate to us goes to our programs. Um, so if you'd like to support Alima, please check with your employer for any opportunities um, to do so. Um, and once again, thank you so much. And if there are any questions, um, we'd be happy to, to answer them. I think we have and we actually didn't get one box. question in the chat that I think would be interesting for people to hear about, which is around the the places and the environments that Alima works in. Um, so uh, often there are, you know, environments where there are insurgents or uh, conflict areas that Alima has to work in. And so the question is, how does Alima engage in those in those areas? You know, whether it's avoiding insurgents or or maybe needing to deal with them or or, or security risks around that. Woodmi, do you have any reactions to that question? Yeah, I, I, I can um, give it a shot. So one of the things I personally had to learn um, on the field is that um, in areas of conflict where we are, there's this integration in the, the community. Some of the like, um, how, do you, how do you call them? The, the, the same people who are like what the jihadists or the, they're the same people in the community, you know, they, they're the fathers, they're 
uncles and cousins and and there's often not that sort of strict uh, uh, delineation of like jihad is separate from the community. They accept us often because we bring, you know, a service that is needed and that, you know, does good to their communities and, and that they value. And, and so in talking to the community and just, you know, expressing to them why this is important. You know, they accept this thing that is good for their kids and for their families. But it's not as if, as far as I know, um, and I may not be privy to like all the background conversations that go on on a security level. I don't know that Alima has like direct one-on-one -on -one exchanges with like jihadist groups and, um, and organizations. But I know that, you know, these people are often parts of the community and members of, you know, the families that come to, to the hospitals and, and the, the centers where we provide service. You know, there is no uh, identifying who's who. What we just do is we do good to everyone alike. The, you know, Arima, like all NGOs that I have known or worked for as on the prince, on the principle of, of neutrality or impartiality means that we're there to provide medical care without distinction by race, creed, color, you know, or political affiliation of any sort. And yeah. so we work as long as we can maintain the connections within the community that allow us to assure, you know, assure or to manage our safety, put it that way. Um, there is a lot of effort at Arima placed in um, monitoring uh, what's going on. And we have a benefit of having a lot of people who work for Alima who are from the regions that we are trying to work in. And so it is a real benefit to have people who have grown up in Eastern Mali or Northern Niger who are working in Alima operations. Um, and they, I think, are one of the added features that allow us to operate in places where maybe others would not feel um, as adequately protected. Um, and it's just because of their cultural competence, I would put it that way. Um, then the, and then on a more tactical level, what it means is that we generally operate with mobile clinics because it's not safe to put people in places. So they, you know, they get they, they have a base and then they go out into they have a they go out into the field and try to provide health care you know once a week, twice a week, depending. Um, and then the third thing that I would say is that um, when we don't think we're safe, we leave. And so um, that happened this year in Monguno in uh, northern Nigeria. There was just, it was getting too difficult. There were too many instances where it seemed like aid workers were being targeted. And so um, in spite and in face of you know, overwhelming medical need, we had to go. And so that's, I mean, pretty much how we do it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us and, and have a great evening. I hope you learned a lot about Alima. Thank you. Thank you. Sleep well, Bundi. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>